Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ben Pomquist, and I'm going to kick things off, and I'm excited for you all to be joining us. Um, I'm with an organization called Partners for Dignity and Rights. We're a support organization for movements uh, around the country struggling for um, human rights, um, especially economic and social rights. And um, we have a great crew of folks here today who are going to be talking about um, public budgets as spaces for organizing and tools for advancing um, justice and equity and all the things we care about. Um, so in a minute, I am going to introduce them. Um, but I'll just say first, um, this is part of a brand new web webinar series we're doing. So I'm really excited to launch it with this crew of folks. Um, this is part of our new social contract initiative, um, which we started a few years ago out of the recognition that in order to achieve a just and equitable society, we really need to fundamentally rewrite the rules that govern our politics and our economy. Governance is usually really elite and top down and exclusionary. The rules are sort of written and handed down to us. And at best, you know, if we're lucky, um, we might get to go out and vote every couple of years. Um, but we know that this is not working at a lot of things, right? So from the pandemic to climate change to structural racism and inequality, we really have to develop new policies and new institutions that are actually capable of meeting the big challenges we face. Um, and it's also exciting. It's an exciting opportunity for us to be working together to really envision and build together the world we want to live in, one where everybody um, is you know, able to live together in equality. So, um, our goal on these webinars is to convene a series of public discussions, just like this one, um, where we're bringing together brilliant and creative people to help come up with exciting ideas and models and strategies um, that hold a lot of potential to be widely expanded and form the basis for a really just and equitable and inclusive democracy. Um, so today, we're focusing on public budgets as critical sites of action for advancing justice, deepening democracy, and meeting our shared needs. And I'm super excited to have this collection of folks with us to help us think through sort of some of what communities are already doing on the ground and what we can learn from that. Um, so I'm very quickly going to ask folks to introduce themselves, your name and organization, where you're calling in from today. Um, and if you, Ruth, could start it us off and then pass it along, please. I sure can. Thanks, Ben. My name is Ruth Idakola, and I am a program director for the Dignity in Schools Campaign National. Um, I am located in uh, New Orleans. And I guess I'll pass to the Baron. Uh Hello, everybody. Uh, LeBaron Sims. I'm the Associate Director of Policy and Research at Demos. Um, for those of you who may not, who may not know who we are, um, we're a nonprofit uh, policy research legal movement building outfit that's based out of New York and DC, although I personally am based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and we work to protect and expand democratic access to our political institutions and our economy. Um, and with that, I will pass it to Sherry. Thanks, LeBaron. Hi, everybody. My name is Sherry Davis. I serve as the co-executive director at the Participatory Budgeting Project. I'm calling in from Delaware, but I'm normally in the Bay Area. And the Participatory Budgeting Project, also known as PVP, is a national nonprofit committed to ensuring that community members can decide how public budgets are spent and how policy is made. And I have the pleasure of passing it to Peter. Thanks, Sherry. <clears throat> and I am Peter Sabonis, he, him. I work uh, with Ben um, at uh, Partners for Dignity and Rights and with Ruth as well. And uh, I work on um, community-driven um, economic and, and community development uh, with, uh, with the emphasis on community land ownership, community land trusts. That's it. Over to you, Ben. Thanks, everyone. And again, my name is Ben Palmquist. I'm in the Bay Area on Ohlone land and working with our partners all over the country. Um, 
And uh, just one sort of thing uh, for attendees, there's a Q&A function. So as speakers are speaking today, if you have questions you would like folks to answer, please type those in and we'll keep an eye on that and hold some space at the end to answer some of those. Um, and what we're gonna do here is first move through some sort of um, short background from everybody on, on some of the campaigns and the work they're involved in. And then we're gonna get into a little bit more fluid conversation with each other, really thinking through um, how we can use budget as tools. And it, it feels really important at this moment, you know, Congress is sort of debating whether to <laughs> let um, the government shut down, you know, they're debating, you know, what kind of a new budget to pass. And so budgets are very much in the news. Um, and as you'll be hearing from us, a lot of that where it sort of shows up in, in our lives is at the local level. And so there's a lot of great campaigns that people are working on. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna have Ruth kick us off. And so Ruth, the question I'm hoping you can uh, talk about for us is just, you know, what is it that the Dignity in Schools campaign is doing as it's organizing around school budgets um, in districts across the country? Yeah, thanks. Um, so what we do as an organization, um, primarily kind of our mission is that um, we work around school climate to prevent the pushing of children and young adults into the criminal justice system through schools. Um, the tool that is used um, by school districts is, you know, um, the means of suspensions and expulsions. Um, and so the big part of our work is, you know, to be able to shift what school culture looks like um, and to make it um, holistic and a place where children can thrive and actually learn as opposed to a place of, um, you know, uh, disparate uh, punitive um, measures in terms of, you know, you know, kind of really, you know, dousing, you know, children's spirit in terms of, you know, being in an environment where they're supposed to learn. But anyway, specifically with budget, um, a big part of our work is to make sure that are really pushing government to move the money that is used um, to put law enforcement in schools and move that to, you know, kind of more holistic um, practices such as, you know, having more counselors, um, peace builders, restorative justice practices, positive discipline, um, community organizers, um, culturally relevant um, curriculum, those kinds of things. Um, and really to shift policy federally so that money is taken out of that particular way of actually policing children and actually putting it into more positive ways of you know, nurturing children. Um, I actually looked up um, several things um, as I was preparing for this, and I was looking at the state of Louisiana, um, which is where I live, and uh, kind of looking at school budgets um, locally here where I am. And from 2015 to 2016, the state of Louisiana spent 20 million for law enforcement in schools. And then just, you know, a year later from 2017 to 2018, that went up, you know, four or 5% to 32 million. So that's how much money that we spend. And this is just one state, you know, using to police children in schools. So um, we're just trying to make sure that we are supporting communities across the nation. We are a coalition of um, about a hundred grassroots um, organizations across the country to support them in their communities to push for local policy to remove money from policing of children and to move it, you know, to where children actually have support to learn and to thrive. Thank you, Ruth. Um... Yeah, I know Dignity in Schools has really been inspiring me for many years, and I'm excited to hear more from you shortly in our discussion, um, but I'm going to quickly bounce things over to Peter to similarly tell us about some of the work uh, you've been involved in, in your case, on the ground in Baltimore um, in struggles for permanently affordable community-controlled housing. So could, uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the happy ending, um, which is that uh, over six years of uh, working with a coalition in Baltimore, we were able to 
to introduce community land ownership as a policy tool, as an organizing um, issue, and uh, create a, a city housing trust fund funded by a tax on the sale of housing um, priced at over a million dollars. And the fund um, through political mobilization by the coalition has been able to prioritize community land trusts in its uh, disposition of money for its first three years. Now that's the, that's the happy ending to a sad, sad story. Um, and it begins with the budget. Um, and we started, five, six years ago with a campaign that we called the 2020 campaign, um, $20 million. We have vacant housing issue in Baltimore, $20 million to deconstruct vacant housing using folks um, who are returning citizens, who, you know, coming out of uh, the, the criminal justice and carceral system. And then another $20 million for um, vacant housing rehabilitation through community land trusts, $40 million, 2020, great vision, et cetera. Where's the money kind of come from? Um, Baltimore City never has any money for the things that we want, um, but yet they find money for uh, a new convention center, a uh, new convention hotel, an arena, corporate headquarters. Um, and we figured out they get that money, despite the, ha despite the fact they have no money, from borrowing it. They get it from bonds from general obligation bonds, tax revenue bonds, tax increment financing bonds, TIF bonds. And where our campaign was essentially, all right, let's do for the community what you folks have been doing for business and entertainment and tourism um, in your trickle down neoliberal framework that doesn't work for the last 50 years. Let's pay for it with municipal bonds. And um, so we dove into the budget. And um, we knew there was one budget, and that one budget was divided into two parts. There's an operations budget that deals with programs, and um, then there's this bond budget, which is called a, a capital budget. And uh, we set our sights on the bond budget, drilled down on it, and what we found was um, there was some transparency and no opportunity for participation. The transparency that existed through websites, websites in a, in a city that has a problem with, uh, with access anyway, um, was either too simple or too complex and then left out some key uh, steps. Um, we got comfortable with the complexity, went through previous bond budgets and even the, the, the proposals. Um, and, and we found all these projects that that we didn't think the public would support, you know, like the, uh, I read some like the, the police crime lab facility, the Southwest Police District Station New Roof, the Mitchell Courthouse Petite Jury Assembly Expansion. And we thought, this is great. We can just, you know, say, hey, we're, we're doing, you know, deeply affordable housing, we're employing folks, et cetera. We found out too late, too late um, that, um, we were a bit too visionary and also that the one step that they left out on the website and every other place was that they had essentially priorities that were set um, behind closed doors to some extent. They had bond buckets, priorities. Um, they had schools, they had community economic development, they had parks and public facilities, information technology, affordable housing. And each of these buckets were of different sizes. You had like 60, 38 million for the schools, 6 million for affordable housing, you know, uh, 51 million for community and economic development. And like the, the, the projects were little marbles that you, you stuck in, in each of these buckets, but the buckets were all different sizes. And what we wanted to do, we wanted to, to take money from one bucket and put it in another. And that was not allowed because this had already been set. And so we're ready to mobilize, show our people power, take over hearings, et cetera. And we find out that we're confronted with um, forums where they're saying, well, you can't do that. Um, this has already been set up. Um, and it's already been approved and uh, it's gonna go to the voters in, in two years, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. So what we had to do, we had to retool and um, essentially go around 
all uh, the whole process and city officials. Um, we were fortunate to have a, 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 a city ballot initiative in Baltimore City where you get 10,000 signatures to put stuff on the ballot to amend the city charter. And we decided we we're gonna amend the city charter um, to appropriate money. Um, and uh, that's, like, that's like putting putting an appropriation bill in the 14th Amendment, you know, uh, for the U.S. Constitution. It's questionable legality, but the mayor got scared. Um, she cut a deal with us, and uh, we pulled our, our, our budget uh, ballot initiative and, uh, and essentially ended up with uh, the happy ending that, uh, that I started with. That's it. Thank you, Peter. Um, it's a good ending to a story, but a good illustration of how uh, this work can be very challenging along the way, which I'm sure is something we'll hear more about. Um, um, next up, LeBaron, could you, I know you're working on um, both work to eliminate racial income and wealth gaps and, and advancing a vision of economic democracy. Could you tell us a little bit about that and in particular, how you see sort of public budgets as being a tool in that work? Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks for the question. Thanks for letting me go after Ruth and Peter um, for really setting up the importance of, of, of public budgets. And I think in particular, um, some of the challenges that we face um, uh, in accessing the channels and accessing the rooms uh, in which some of these decisions are being made. Um, something that we've noticed in our work um, as we've been building out this economic democracy portfolio is that in these types of circles and you know, op-eds and policy discussions around the country, uh, when we talk about the economy and we talk about resource and allocation processes, what we're really talking about is power. We're talking about income, wealth, access to vital infrastructure and natural resources, and those are all means of consolidating, hoarding, and wielding power. Um, and I'm sure you've all heard at some point that you know budgets are moral documents. Uh, they indicate where our priorities lie, who and what we value, uh, but those decisions may or may not be subject to community control or community input. Um, and they may or may not reflect the actual desires and interests and best interests of the community, um, so much as the interests of those in power. And so public budgets, whether in city council meetings or as we're seeing debated now in the halls of Congress, are manifestations of power in one way or another. Um, and maintaining a healthy society requires that we remain accountable to one another. Um, so when we talk about um, advancing economic liberation, um, what we need to do is really reckon honestly with our flaws and be clear that the economic conditions faced by black and brown people um, like higher rates of joblessness and poverty and homelessness and hunger. Um, those are the intentional output of 400 years of decision making and policy designed to advance white supremacy and the concentration of private wealth. <laughs> and these economic conditions create the barriers to participating in our democracy and lead to distrust in government and lead to those disparities in political and economic power for black and brown people. So economic liberation requires us to move beyond just policymaking and delve, I think, a little bit more deeply into these questions of power. Like how can black and brown communities build power and increase their autonomy and their control over the economy? Um, local politics, whether city council meetings or county boards and commissions and in these budget, res budget resolution conversations, um, those are our most immediate and, you know, quite possibly our most impactful opportunity to collectively govern and to hold our society and our elected officials accountable and our institutions accountable to our society's members and to their best interests. Um, and that's what the new economic democracy project at Demos is really working toward. So right now we're working on a series of four case studies. Um, to dive into some of these questions of power and of tactics through um, some recent examples of community members and organizations across the country that are working to reclaim their, um, their community's power over their economic resources. And we're looking at Houston, we're looking at, um, uh, we're looking at New York City, uh, we're looking at Northern Virginia, um, and we are looking at, oh, what is the fourth one? <sighs> Drop the ball. 
<laughs> uh, Pittsburgh, actually, uh, Pittsburgh and Baltimore, um, the fight over the public water supply, privatization of public water. Um, and so um, these case studies focus broadly on really three, like very broad priority issues. The first is deconcentrating corporate economic and political power, and you know, especially some of the new forms like big tech and the big data monopolies. Um, the second is expanding and making more equitable our investment in and the administration of public goods and essential infrastructure. Um, and the third one is building out civic power and building out the mechanisms for the multiracial, multi-ethnic majority to take a lead role in our economic decision-making processes. And I think that last part is the key that unlocks the potential of this work. Um, because what we face today at every level of civic society is the rise of increasingly unaccountable and anti-democratic institutions. Um, and you see that in New Orleans with the rise or the privatization of the public school system and the charters. Um, I think Peter outlined that very, very clearly in his remarks about the, the way that corporations and corporate interests are prioritized in the budget, budgeting process in Baltimore. Um, and I've got some notes about Atlanta's budgeting process that we can get into a little bit later. <laughs> um, but these institutions have consolidated power over the years through anti-government austerity narratives and policies that starve and erode our public institutions. So by restoring this balance back in favor of the public and by centering and prioritizing and baking public participation into our institutions, and we can make sure that the power of accountability is returned to the hands of the people. And I think that's the first step toward like true civic and economic equity. Thank you, LeBaron. That was great. And that is a perfect lead in on um, the note of participation to Sherry. Um, Sherry, can you tell us a little bit more about what participatory budgeting is looking like across the country? Absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm really fired up now for our discussion period. And it's hard for me not to be like, let's talk about all of the things that the three panelists previous described. Um, but to answer your question, uh, Ben, around you know what is participatory budgeting i think folks have already named the importance and also the difficulty in one just accessing the budget understanding it never mind being able to direct how resources move and i want to take a step back before i describe what participatory budgeting is and just simply put give you an overview of how budgets generally work right now in most spaces Usually, a person or a small group of people come together and look at the expenses in a municipality or agency or city in the year previous. And then they look ahead and they make some guesses around what expenses are going to be incurred over a 12 month period. And then they submit that guess, that draft budget to another person or small group of people, sometimes it's city council. And then what happens is community has an opportunity to see everyone's guesses. And then they typically watch a discussion unfold between these two entities that have power and control to make decisions about those investments. Sometimes they can testify like at a hearing, but generally the decisions in the budget have already been made. And then the budget becomes actual effect, right? We've talked about budgets or moral documents. And so we're seeing investments move forward based on a person or small group of people's best guesses around what a lot of people need. And so what makes me excited about participatory budgeting, it's a very different way to consider decisions in the budget. And this process is seen across the world. I think it's newer in the United States, but it's over 30 years old in places like the global south. There are entire countries that engage folks in participatory budgeting. And essentially what we're talking about is bringing folks together to understand, one, what is the budget? Just to do some general budget literacy, but also understand some root causes of what's happening in the community. What are the challenges that we see? What's going really well? What are the gaps that we're experiencing? Where is there a lack of investment that's infect affecting people? And how do we understand the expertise of the people that live in that space? And how can they 
make some decisions about better investments for funding coming down the line. So essentially participatory budgeting is an opportunity for community to design, shape, manage, and direct a portion of the budget to meet their needs, which is very different from a person or a small group of people making a lot of guesses. Instead, participatory budgeting creates an opportunity for us to learn a lot, build capacity, not only generate power to make decisions, and then be able to really put some teeth around accountability by participating in a process as opposed to watching a process happen. And so it's really about, I really like the way that LeBaron said it, it's really about finding a, a, a balance, restoring balance and power and PD or participatory budgeting is a process that, or a framework that can be used in order to see that restoration of power happen. Thank you, Sherry. This is, there's so much you're each saying that I want to dig into. I, I think we should just extend this webinar by like three more hours so we can get into it all. But we're going to uh, just like, uh, yeah, see how far we can get in the next 30 minutes. I'm just so, there's so much more I want to hear. Um, the last question I'll throw out and then I'll just open it up to everyone. Um, so audience members, please, you can feel free to use the Q&A feature if you want to chime in with questions and our panelists will be asking questions of each other. Um, but I think you know one of the challenges I think that many of our grassroots partners run into when they're organizing around budgets is um, that like our communities and our needs are often pitted against each other, right? Um, and so I'm seeing this right now in one of you know some of the groups we've been working with are advocating in the federal budget right now to try to make sure that people's healthcare needs are being met both by expanding every Medicaid in all 50 states and also expanding Medicare so that it actually covers dental care and vision and hearing for people, um, lowering the Medi Medicare eligibility age um, and allowing the government to bargain down drug prices. But what the, the message that they're getting back from people in Congress and you know even people in think tanks and stuff is like, oh, well, we can't afford all that. You know, you have to pick one, one of these things, but you can't have it all. And they're, you know, pitting, pitting you know, people's organizations against each other to sort of try to force a fight between people who are on the front lines of struggles for Medicare and struggles for Medicaid. And so, yeah, I'm just curious if any of you have sort of, from the work that you've been involved in, if you have sort of any insights or suggestions for folks who may be finding themselves in um, similar situations, right, to sort of like, uh, how do, how do we get out of this situation where sort of our, our needs and our communities are, are being pitted against one another? Well, ben, I, I might be able to kick us off because the first thing that actually comes to mind for me is one, just how valid that is. And two, how the solution isn't going to be either or. Even when I talk about participatory budgeting, it, I think it's one element in a plethora of strategies that need to be enacted at the same time for us to be successful. And that's why we at the Participatory Budgeting Project launched Democracy Beyond Elections, a collaborative coalition of folks. I think many of the panelists are actually parts of this coalition that have come together to really say, you know what, rather than be pit against each other, how do we begin to set an agenda and build strategies that allow us to see community members not make either or decisions, but to ground and root causes, build strategies toward community control where they can direct. And part of that is actually healthy dialogue. And I think that often there's not space, safe facilitation, appropriate containers for healthy dialogue that gets us to a place where we have a plan that works for people and specifically centers folks that are have been historically and traditionally most marginalized, right? If we're gonna talk about equity, I think that we have to set up conversations, but also set up mobilization and the way that we organize so that folks that are impacted are able to participate wholly. And I think that that's like a big thing that we think about with democracy beyond elections. And I think the last thing that I'll, gonna, I'll say about this and I'll drop a link into the chat really quickly is this coalition, Democracy Beyond Elections, DBE, affectionately referred to, has really been thinking about how do we use 
opportunities like the American Rescue Plan funding that's coming down federally to really see communities be at the center of moving decisions like that. And rather than being pitted against each other, how do we instead come together and actually fund organizations on the ground that are doing the work of ensuring that community members have the opportunity to control how dollars that are directed toward them should be spent. It makes so much sense. Uh, the link that I dropped into the chat is actually an explainer of how tools like PB can be used by folks at a moment like this. And I think it really comes back to leaning on some of these principles of equity and fusing that into organi or how we organize, but most importantly, ensuring that community members are at the center, not only of fighting each other, but directing where we pay attention because they're speaking to their lived experience. And I think it's really important for us to shape larger initiatives, both federally and regionally around that lived experience. I really appreciate that um, and that perspective. Um, you know, when I when I think about or when I've been asked about really like these infrastructure bills, right? And, and something that we've been thinking about too is setting up these accountability structures, um, not just at the local level, right? Where you are face to face with your representatives, with your city council, um, but at the federal level, right? And how we can really bake um, individual community participation into some of these federal um, allocation processes. Um, but something that, that, and I think we can, we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but um, when, when I hear that zero sum, how are we gonna pay for it? How much will it cost pushback? Um, I always think it's more important to consider what not acting is already costing us. So from the wildfires and the heat waves on the West Coast to the flooding down South and in New York City to the lead in the water that's still plaguing cities all across the country, like the urgency of the crises that we face right now requires that we take bold action right now. And us facing a myriad of crises simultaneously, I didn't even mention the pandemic <laughs> that we are, what, 18 months into at this point? Um, my, many, many more months than that at this point. <laughs> um, you know, we're facing a number of crises, but, you know, if we're being, we aren't being asked, you know, pick one crisis, right? We're being told to ignore all of the crises, right? And so I actually read a really fascinating article this morning, and I'll, I'll throw a link to it in the chat about the pro-slavery origins of the austerity narrative and how it was leveraged by a few founding fathers, um, but it really solidified during like the decade or two that leading up to the Civil War. Um, and I get that, you know, History is not everybody's favorite subject, and you know, especially right now with like the you know bad faith, critical race theory uproar. But I've always found it really instructive and really telling and kind of reassuring at times <laughs> um, that so much of what we face right now has been faced down before and it has often been addressed. And so I like to look to history to like the New Deal and the Reconstruction and the Great Society and other like successful social movements over the years to inform our work today. And we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel. Like, as, but as, you know, as Sherry said, you know, uh, participatory budgeting has been around for decades, right? There are ideas out there. Um, you know, when we're doing these, you know, as, as we're doing these case studies and collecting stories, we're not out here trying to reinvent the wheel. We're not out here trying to push new ideas. Like, good ideas are already out there. We just need to make some decisions, right? We need to just say yes. We need to choose to act. Um, because if we're not choosing to act, then forces outside of our control are going to act upon us. And once that happens, you know, it's going to be very hard to get control back. And I mean that like in a very broad sense, like a biblical sense. <laughs> yeah, I was, I can jump in here and, um, echo all of that, um, especially in terms of, of, of community and community-based institutions that um, are, are, are uh, places of real democracy where people are bringing themselves wholly and participating. And then, and then these places also practicing accountability with each other and then being able to, to, uh, to, 
to take that um, to the public policy level. Um, you know, the one thing that that I think, and when I turn to think of, of budgets, um, and and LeBaron, I've I've read similar um, budget analysis, but this whole this whole austerity, privatization, deregulation, tax cuts, it's not simply anti-government. <laughs> we know what it is. I mean, it's it's anti-black, it's anti-persons uh, of color, and it's also a means of redistributing wealth and income um, to uh, a group of elites. And so when I look at this and I look at all the folks who are involved in, in you know, healthcare advocates and housing advocates and education, et cetera, and how we're pitted against each other, you know, I often see that we're, we're, we, we're not talking about, uh, we're, we're not using like a critical <laughs> budgetary analysis in terms of, of like you, you started with Le, LeBaron about power. I mean, what, who is, who is benefiting from this, you know, and um, I, I'm not saying that we can all get together on the same narrative and, and, and the same structural analysis, but I do think that that would be very helpful um, in, in terms of, of, uh, of, of bridging some of these, these silos. Um, and I mean, I know in the, in the community development and the housing silos, but just putting together a coalition just around something like like 2020 um, and, a, and a housing trust fund was there were silos within silos, you know, and uh, <laughs> so and and oftentimes it it takes somebody just to just to who's got some power within within that whole system um, just to bring folks together. Um, so um, I, you know, a critical analysis of budgets um, and, and I mean, operationalizing this stuff is everything. It's everything. It's the devil is in the details. And, and um, I appreciate what, what Sherry said about folks coming wholly to these places. I think also, what needs to be happening on a consistent basis, um, as LeBaron had shared, you know, kind of not reinventing the wheel. So, you know, we have knowledge of movements um, not too long ago that centered um, the concept of economics and that that be a foundational piece of organizing and how we organize. And I think that unfortunately over the past maybe 50 years, you know, economics gets talked about a lot, but not in a way that is building power um, amongst people who are disenfranchised, those who have been rendered, you know, poverty stricken, powerless. Um, I think that that conversation speaking specifically about it, um, I think, participatory budgeting is um, a excellent tool. But I think that even beyond that, to just get people to, let's, let's have some more conversations and consistent conversations around economics. And you know how do we gain resources? And I know that that's what we're talking about, but I don't think that it's explicit enough for people on mass in terms of the grassroots level have a deep understanding of how much that connects to our daily existence. Um, so, you know, that's something that I've been thinking about the past couple of years about how to build that piece into the work that DSC does, you know, with our membership, um, and being more vocal about, you know, that particular word when it comes to poor people, you know, um, yeah. Um, and I invite all of you to jump in with questions if there's sort of things you want to ask each other. But a, another question I have, and I'm looking at you, Sherry, because I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think you used to work in local government, right? And so, you know, we I are going to out me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, so at the moment, we are all working out sort of outside of the system, right? Like we're, like supporting communities that are organizing um, around budgets um, to pressure sort of from the outside in. Um, but, you know, there's many different kinds of people work in local governments and many of them are, you know, allies who would like to be, you know, working on the inside to help find ways um, that communities and people in government can work together. I'm just curious if you or anybody else has sort of ideas for folks who may be in those kinds of positions. Well, you know, I joke that normally I say very quickly, hey, y'all, I am a recovering government employee. I worked in local government for 15 years. Um, and then people are like, how old are you? And that's important because I actually started working in local government really young. I started working in local government when I was 14 years old and I got a summer job. And when my summer job was over, I was like, see you tomorrow, because how, how are you going to, how are you going to do anything? You ask me about what high school students need all the time. And then I was observing pretty big decisions being made because they were asking who was there. And for me, it painted a very clear picture for me at a young age how important it was for us to be there, right? For community to be there. And I felt like I worked in local government in the city of Boston, Massachusetts. There were not many black and brown people in city hall, period. And this was an honest conversation I had at the end of my summer job. I said, how on earth are you going to know what folks in Mattapan, Dorchester, and Roxbury are going through if I'm not here? And they were like, all right, you can, you can come back and, and work here after school. And in my career trajectory, that turned into me managing divisions, creating entire departments, and then always having this guiding star of opening that door wider and wider and wider to see the butts in the seats change, to see community show up, not just show up, right? For me, it's more than civic engagement, it's, it's civic participation, it's civic control over resources. And for me, that was a really important lever to begin like really pulling open. And, and I thought it was just going back to a comment that Ruth made it, it's, it's not just like one tool, it's not just PD, right? It, I think it has to be entry points that are beyond being engaged and that look like participating in ways that have real meaning. If I'm a, a single parent and I'm going to a community focus group that is supposed to be about bettering my community or this development that's being built across the street from, from my home, and I'm managing childcare and my jobs and all of these things to be there, and then I leave with zero return on my time investment, it's going to be really difficult to convince me to do that again and again and again, and what the, what the outcome of that engagement is. But if we're able to move away from that into deep learning capacity building and able to see people actually make decisions about what happens across the street from their homes, then, then that's a totally different conversation. We're able to change that community meeting into not a meeting, but instead a workshop, working group, and an opportunity for us to do some planning, decision-making, for us to do it together, for us to participate in this together, for us to move away from seeing the budget as a mysterious thing, but instead to see the budget as a tool. And I think we're kind of far away from folks that I grew up with being able to access a public budget as a tool for their, for their well-being. And long answer, but Ben, my my thinking when you ask that question is folks that are in those positions, that's actually important for us to be in those roles, to pull those levers, to open those doors, to not replicate what has happened yesterday and to say, look, tomorrow, actually today, we could do it different right now. And my best advice, but don't say you heard it from me, is, is ask for forgiveness and, and not permission because you, you'll get a no very quickly but I do think that sometimes you can say, I'm sorry I made something great. Peter, were you gonna jump in and say something? I was gonna ask a question to everybody about, um, 
about the about taxes, about revenue. Um, and, um, you know, it, it just seemed to me that we as a, as, as a coalition, what we ended up getting together with a bunch of different people in, in housing who had, who saw different parts of the, the elephant and thought it was a whole elephant, you know, and we're part of that too, you know, hey, community land ownership and, but there's other folks that, you know, like housing mobility and uh, fair housing or, um, you know, public housing, we got to, you know, let's, we got to be putting money in. And we're all able to um, come together with the understanding that we needed more money, all of us and, and all of our, our, our various pieces. And, um, so I'm just wondering, like, and is a question for the other panelists. Um, just the, is revenue, it's not an issue we talk about so much, even in, in participatory budgeting, it, it seems to me. Um, we, uh, but getting folks involved also in, in, in these, these, these really re redistributive um, issues that go on in our tax system. Um, just is is that also a place that that we can find some um, common ground or or break down silos, um, or do we start first with expenditures? Well, I, I just have something super quick. I know I've been talking a lot, but just Peter, I love this question because I I think that it's it's both, right? Again, we're talking about tax dollars. We're talking about dollars that affect people. Where does that come from? It comes from people, right? And that there's a revenue connection there. But oftentimes we see tax measures, right, that might create a fund for youth engagement in a particular place. Or look at California, where we're seeing tax measures that are directly tied to the public education system. And so I do think that there is a really important revenue connection. And oftentimes we see community really get behind measures that allow or that equate to a really small increase in taxes but when they understand that they're going to be able to then generate one some cost savings but two appropriate investments and i think that that becomes a systemic shift that's really important so i just i love the question i don't have a lot of answers but it's all connected no absolutely and i think like i think the other the other part of that and you know peter touched on it a little bit as he was describing the priorities in the Baltimore document, um, but there's the tax breaks, right? Like there's the money that we're paying in and there's the money that others aren't paying in, right? Um, and I think people don't necessarily have a very clear idea of, A, just all of the tax breaks that are being offered to corporations at the local level, at the state level, you know, sports teams, you know, um, businesses like Amazon coming into communities and reshaping the landscape. Um, and not paying a dime in taxes as they do so, um, and uh, effectively hamstringing or, or you know the the local government or making the local government and, and the local labor force subservient to them, you know, it, it essentially creating a, a new company town. Um, and I think that especially and as Sherry was was just was just mentioning, like when folks get a sense of just how far their tax dollars can go. Um, and when a city is smart about how they're investing those tax dollars, right? Like it could even be in an investment fund where tax dollars are being used to generate more wealth um, and then reintroduce, reincorporate, um, redistribute that wealth into the back into the community, right? Through community investment, through uh, relief funds, through housing initiatives. Um, it's, I think that, and, and especially when people understand also um, just how far, how, um, I'll say one of the challenges too is the, just the lack of transparency and equity in the process. Um, and, you know, as an example, I mentioned Atlay and I live there. <laughs> um, and they very recently adopted their budget for 2022, um, over 710 million allotted in general funds, and a third of that is earmarked for the police. Um, and this comes after an extremely fraught year <laughs> um, for Atlanta police, um, you know, where the killing of a young man named Richard Brooks 
and the violent arrests of college students, kettling of demonstrators, tear gassing of peaceful demonstrators, uh, made national headlines. Um, so by comparison, the Atlanta Citi Citizens Review Board, the Public Defenders Department, and the Department of Grants and Community Development, which are all either explicitly or implicitly um, tasked with preventing the abuses of the carceral and punishment systems, combined only receive $7 million, right, or 1% of the general fund. So even as those scandals are making like national news, you know, the city made a big deal out of diverting 13 million in general funds from the Department of Corrections into the mayor's community engagement programs for 2021. And they did it, you know, to their credit, but in this new 2022 budget restores the level of corrections back to basically what it was, right? And cuts that executive office budget by exactly that $13 million that it transferred last year. And so those community, those, those community engagement initiatives, those community support initiatives, those, those don't get the chance to fail. They don't get the chance to make mistakes because they never try, right? The second that people turn their backs, the people, the second people take their eyes off the ball, and the second that, you know, we are removed from the process and we're no longer in, literally in the streets raising hell, <laughs> they go back to business as usual. And it's, it, it, and I think as, as Peter demonstrated so, so clearly earlier in, in the conversation, you need to be able to keep that pressure up and it's exhausting and you need a full bench to do it and you need a, a, a roster of people um, to cycle in and out, but you really need to be able to build community support and get people into the process. And these processes are built to keep people out. So part of that too is that inside outside process. You need to have some inside leverage, some leverage within these systems in order to be able to get them to respond to the outside. But you all, but also, and you know, it's, it's, it's not easy, um, but a couple of our, our partners um, at Demos are uh, inclusive democracy project partners like Texas Organizing Project. Um, are they, they've created um, the Boards and Commissions Leadership Institute, um, which it, you know draws on a, a model created by Urban Habitat out of the Bay Area. Um, and they're solidly building a roster, a backbench of future political leaders, future community leaders, um, heads and members of local boards, county and city boards and commissions, who are at the table making these decisions and are working with this community organization to ensure that the needs of the community and the needs of the movement are priorities for these boards and for these commissions. Um, and it really is that give and take, that, that consistent, constantly fluid process of building power and making sure that that power goes back, to the, goes back into the community in a virtuous cycle. And I know we're winding down, but I have a question for you, Ruth. Can I ask you? Oh, for sure. Oh, so my question is, um, I have a front row seat right now at watching some young people decide in Phoenix how they're going to understand what safety is, right? They've just terminated their SRO contract. So there will be no more armed officers in the district in Phoenix. And they're moving into a space where they're ideating and getting ready to invest in solutions of safety. I think that you have a front row seat at some of those beautiful outcomes of young people maybe being able to direct investment, but also participate in like solid investments around safety. I think safety is one of those things that people get pit against all the time when we start talking about budgets. And so I was really curious if you've seen anything that you're inspired by when it comes to young people, especially being able to, to direct and shape what their relationship to safety is in schools. It's amazing that you're asking me this question because I just had a conversation today with one of our members in Montgomery County in the um, DMV area. And they just, um, in the past couple of weeks, were able to successfully move SROs and any kind of law enforcement completely out of their schools. And um, what I can do, because I know that we're out of time, is that you and I can talk and I can give you that information and link you up with the sister out who's out there who was, you know, supporting the organized, but the youth did it, you know what I'm saying? And so 
there's stuff that is happening, you know what I'm saying, in terms of the grassroots level. And that's what continues to inspire me to continue to do the work. But also, you know, to what LeBaron said, you know, just a few minutes ago, we have to remember that these structures are set up deliberately, right? They're set up deliberately for us to not have access, to not have the power, to not have the money. Um, and I feel like, you know, sometimes I don't think that we forget that necessarily as people who do this work. Um, but I think that it definitely needs to be at the forefront in terms of, you know, the building of power. Um, yeah, um, I think that um, it's about the organizing, honestly. Um, that's all it is. We got to out organize them. Um, you know, this is the way that we do it. And so very grateful for this platform and for partners for bringing us together. You know, I get to meet Cherie and LeBaron and, you know, I know that we're going to continue to talk. So um, let's do that. Yes, thank you all so much. I'm, I'm so bummed to have to cut things off here. Um, it's fine. <laughs> I knew it was going to be tight to get it in an hour, but I just want to hear from all of you so much more. Um, the one thing I want to do before we close um, is put in a plug. So as Sherry mentioned, we're all part of the Democracy Beyond Elections Coalition. And we are just launching our first campaign, which is exciting, which is a one-year campaign to support local communities all over the country that are organizing to have a direct say in how um, public funds are being spent from the American Rescue Plan, which is one of the big bills that Congress passed and funds are now flowing through local governments. Um, and so I just posted in the chat, um, we actually have some small grant money that we're giving away and um, are gonna be able to provide technical assistance to some community groups on the ground in different places. And so we have a, a um, grant opportunity here that's open for the next couple of weeks, uh, or actually just till next week, I think. So um, it's unfortunately a tight turnaround at this point, but we would definitely um, welcome anyone to apply if you are doing any organizing like that, or if you know anyone who might be, please spread the word as well. Um, and Sherry, feel free to jump in on that, but if um, deadline October 1st, thank you. Um, on that note, just thank you all so much. This is just, um, thank you for sharing your wisdom and inspiration and look forward to talking to you all soon. Thanks. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. All right, thank Bring you. Bring the whole space with everybody. Take care. Amen.